morning to all the viewers uh, and good morning to my three panelists. Uh, my name is Amita Virmani. Um, I represent an organization called the Education Alliance. <clears throat> I'm also a Kamal Nayan Bajaj Fellow of the Ananta Aspen Center. Um, today, we're going to be spending an hour with three very illustrious and dynamic women, uh, all of whom I'm sure you've heard of. Um, this is part of the Women Speaks uh, series of the Ananta Aspen Center. This is part six of the series, but I believe the first virtual conversation that we're going to be having. The topic of today's conversation is looking at the future, building a new normal. Um, I am going to spend the next hour or so um, speaking to these three wonderful women um, about their experience over the last three months uh, since the time our country has been gripped with the crisis that we're all undergoing right now. Um, and I'm going to um, ask them questions both on their personal as well as their professional lives, how they have dealt with the challenge, uh, how they have started to overcome the challenge, um, and what are the steps and measures they're putting in place to be able to redefine uh, their own new abnormal, as I'd like to call it. Um, let me start by sharing a little bit about, before I introduce them, um, about what I've gone through. And, and maybe that will just set it in context and we can compare and contrast some of the stories that come from these three ladies. Um, you know, on a personal front, um, I think it's been, uh, it's been difficult, but in relative terms, it's been very easy. Because when I look at the outside world beyond the four walls of my house, uh, I can only imagine what others are going through. Uh, and I haven't had to go through anything, whether it's regard, uh, regarding my job or my wage or putting food on the table for my family um, or uh, ensuring that the safety of the loved ones is taken care of. It's all been, was done in a matter of a few days from the time of the lockdown. Uh, similarly, on a professional front, we were able to work from home. We all had laptops. Uh, we were digitally connected. We could reorganize ourselves. Uh, nobody's uh, lost their job. Nobody lost their income. It was relatively easy. Um, you know, in, in contrast to that, some of my peers in the organization um, who have set up organizations only two, three years ago, uh, sadly have had to shut down. Um, they have not only lost their funding commitments, but also people who had to go back to their hometowns and not, you know, not to return in the near future. And as a result of it, the organization has had to shut down. Uh, similarly, on a personal front, all of us know the stories of migrant laborers and uh, daily wage earners uh, and you know, people on the street who sometimes don't uh, even get accounted for what they've had to go through and what they're currently going through. And I, can't even, I don't even know where to begin, so I won't give those stories. Uh, personally, I've had to let go my office because my landlady was willing to uh, give me a moratorium on the rent and I didn't want to pay unnecessarily. So I've had to do that. And this morning I got a terrible news that one of my dearest friends uh, lost his mother um, early this morning. Uh, not due to COVID, they don't know. She had a comorbidity, but it could have been because of uh, COVID as well. But, you know, the, the reality is knocking on every one of our doors. Um, and, and it is now very close to home. And I know everyone can relate to this. So I wanted to kick off by just sharing a little bit about that. Uh, let me start by introducing the three speakers. Um, all of you know them. Um, and if you don't know them, uh, that's not a good thing. Um, but let me give you a brief introduction. Uh, Anu Aga is the former chairperson of Thermax. Um, she you know, began her career in 1985, but she retired uh, recently as a director of, on the board as well as from the chair of the foundation. She's now involved more in social causes. Uh, uh, her areas of interest clearly are school education. She's been very vocal even as a Rajya Sabha member of parliament speaking about the cause of education and she's involved with two wonderful organizations one being Akanksha and the other being Teach for India so welcome Anu. Um, the second speaker is Reshma Anand who is the CEO of the Hindustan Unilever Foundation and is also a fellow uh, Kamal Nayan Bajaj fellow. Um, Reshma's organization uh, foundation is really involved in creating sustainable uh, water security solutions for India. 
Uh, Reshma has also been the founder of two social ventures, including an advisory firm on sustainable impact and an accelerator for micro entrepreneurs. Um, she is an Aspen fellow, like I said, uh, she's a TED India fellow. Uh, she also anchors a program for young women leaders in business, government, media, uh, to guide their journey from purpose to success. Uh, so welcome Reshma. Uh, and our third speaker is, uh, Radhika Bharatram, who is the joint vice chairperson of the Sri Ram schools. Um, Radhika champions different domains, uh, ranging from education to crafts to social service. Um, she's taken on a lot, um, but really dedicates all of her time to all of these causes. She's been instrumental in setting up the Sri Ram Millennium Schools and the Sri Ram Early Years. Um, she also is involved with the SRF Foundation, which is involved with rural education. Uh, she's a part of the Blind Relief School and the Blind Relief um, Association in the capacity of chairperson and secretary. Um, and she is a member of the CIA Foundation on Women Exemplars. They run a program um, helping uh, not only recognize women, but also help transform their lives. And these are women from rural India. Uh, Radhika, welcome. Um, so with that brief introduction, um, the way I propose to run this session is to um, ask a series of questions of the panelists. The questions will be very similar, uh, but if there are any responsive uh, questions that I want to put in basis their response, I will, uh, you know, uh, pose those to the speakers. So let me start by um, asking Anu, um, specifically around, like I said, uh, you know, this is about COVID and how we've responded to COVID. Um, anu, I would love to get your thoughts to start with, what have the last hundred odd days since the time this hit us? What have the last hundred days really looked like for you? Uh, what has stayed with you? And what have you changed within yourself? And you can look at both personally as well as professionally. Thanks, Amita. Uh, when this new virus was talked about as the worst one, I was full of panic, anxiety, for myself and my loved ones. My daughter had taken me to her house. So emotionally, I was very secured in their house, but I was so scared and I'm not used to have anxiety. It even uh, went into my meditation and I couldn't do meditation without thinking of these thoughts. I was very self-absorbed. And then, I started hearing the stories about the migrant workers, how they are suffering, how they are without food or traveling by road, terrible stories. And that made, that made me realize, like you said, how blessed I am. My family and I are in a lap of luxury. And how insensitive can I get to the plight of people around us. So you only know about it through videos and reading about it. You don't actually see them, which would be more potent. So I started taking interest in the cause of migrant workers and that has kept me very absorbed. I'm realizing how unjust our society is towards eight to 10% of the numbers they represent. And so with a NGO called Dasra, we are looking at ways in which we can help them postpone. Uh, I'm also involved, I mean, I've retired, but with my two NGOs, very, we, meet, uh, we Zoom and talk as a board very often, and we find, want to find out what we can do. Our first priority was to see that nobody goes hungry. When I heard that in Pune, in our community, one lady died of hunger, it shocked me. And so the first is relief, then health and safety, and emotional and mental well being, because there's a lot of frustration and a lot of anger and a lot of violence. So we tied up with NGOs and we had to find devices. Children couldn't openly say, 
I've been beaten up or I'm sexually abused. So we said, if it's thumbs up, things are all right. If it's down, things are not all right. So find innovative ways. We had to find that how do we continue education for our children online? Am I going too far? Shall I stop here? No, no, please, Anu, carry on. Uh, Post-COVID, the job market is going to shrink. So how can we introduce uh, employable skills and entrepreneurship? We also want to experiment when the schools open with blended learning. And we think with that, we will be able to reduce the cost of the teachers. And we have to find innovative ways of reaching out to children. Right now, they have their parents' phone. But when the parents go to work, that won't be available to them. So we as a board have sanctioned tablets for ninth and 10th standard and spent one and a half crores. And little later, hopefully, we'll go to eighth and seventh standard. So, I know that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, there were some uh, follow-up questions I, I had for you, which you've covered, but maybe I'll uh, request you to dwell a little bit further when I come back to you. Sure. Specifically on your involvement with migrant laborers. I know something that haven't been involved in in the past, but clearly you've taken on now. Um, how you have changed your strategy to help Akanksha and TFI deal with the challenge. Again, something you haven't done in the past, but you've changed. So if you can think about that, and I'll come back to you with a follow-up question sure. on this. Um, Reshma, if I can come to you with the same question, you know, what have the last 100 days looked like? What's stuck with you? And what's changed, uh, both again, personally and professionally? Uh, thanks, Amitabh. Um, I think for me, the last 100 days have been a series of waves of emotion. So, uh, I, and, and, but what I still carry is deep anger and I have to figure out a way to, to channelize it. Uh, but, uh, you know, we started our global work from home happened, you know, uh, almost a week or 10 days prior to the lockdown. So we were already preparing for it. And I think the first thing that we did when the lockdown was announced was to actually share all the safety protocols with our partners, because I think everyone was taken aback, right? And so how do you just help people you know, take that next step forward, right? Because no one knows how the big picture is going to pan out. So just making sure that our partners understood, you know, and could learn from all the safety protocols that we had put in place as an organization, I think, so that was our first step. The next step, and I think Anu also spoke about it, was to very quickly ask them what is needed in your, in your areas. Because, you know, we were getting a lot of reports. And I think that, you know, where, uh, you know, typical processes would take months, uh, we just took a leap of faith and trust with all our partners saying, what do you need specifically in your areas and how can we help? So in Punjab, farmers needed support to take their harvest to Mondays because of a token system, which was getting even more complicated because of the curfew that was imposed. In Bengal, food aid was critical because you were seeing a large influx of, you know, of migrants. Uh, in Bundelkhand, again, there was a similar situation where we needed to look at food aid because of, you know, the challenges of the ground. In East UP, we needed to look at whether there was sufficient support in the primary schools that had been converted into quarantine centers. So I think that there was a lot of listening. You know, we just asked our partners, what do you need? And very quickly, we, you know, took decisions to repurpose monies and make sure that that deployment happened before we could figure out what more was required. Um, I think we work primarily because we work primarily in the farm sector. We were very mindful that, you know, there's a standing crop in the fields across the country, which is going to get deeply affected because of these restrictions. So a lot of focus was on ensuring that these families do not add to the migrant crisis, because that would have been a double whammy, you know, across the board. So with partners, the whole focus was just to make sure that the farming economy, you know, stays secure both for Rabi as well as now for Kharif, you know, in terms of making sure that farmers had access to seed, you know, had inputs available so that they could actually focus on their next uh, cropping season as well. I think, Amitabh, we just discovered how many blind spots we had. It has been, it's been so, you know, we, we've been brought down to our knees because we realized, you know, what did we think we're changing the world and making this deep, deep impact 
but we realized we were blindsided by assumptions that we keep making. For instance, on social security, we assumed that the jam trinity is in action, it's working, you know, people are getting cash transfers, all of that is happening. And actually, our, we did a lot of rapid surveys that told us what the gap was, right? And that, you know, told us that on one hand, this is the classic leaky bucket. On one hand, we're trying to add some income into households. On the other hand, what is due to them is not really coming back. Conventionally, as a foundation, you know, you said we work on water security. But I think what, what this whole crisis has done is made us aware of adjacencies. You can't just work on a thematic sector and say, I focus on health, I focus on education, I focus on water. You know, at the end of the day, we're trying to impact lives. And I think what we need to understand is lives are, not, are going to get impacted for various other factors and we need to be prepared for it. Right? So citizen entitlements has become really essential. Investing in our partners on their digital capabilities has become you know, almost uh, a, a, you know, a no-brainer. Uh, partners who had digital capabilities were far faster to respond. Uh, and you know, we've realized that we've got to go beyond programmatic funding and actually look at how do we make core investments in our organization so they're equipped to deal you know, with a lot of what you said we take for granted. We have laptops at home, we have connectivity, we have all of that. So that's been the case. I have deep anger because we have othered the poor in India. Uh, and we've othered them by calling them migrants, by calling them poor. Uh, you know, and, and I think we still continue to do so. Um, and for me, the fetching, you know, images, which I struggle to get out of my head is good, honest, hardworking people had to stand in queues with hands stretched out, uh, you know, for food uh, arms, right? You might say we're giving donations or food kits or whatever. They were all good ways to, to, to describe it, but they didn't ask for it, right? Uh, we, we, we continue to ignore these migrant workers in our backyards. You know, the person who polishes shoes in your local uh, market has vanished. You know, your florist is out of business. The street vendors, you know, who worked around you. And, you know, we still haven't figured out how in your own geography, in your own span, your physical geographical span, what, what are we really doing? Are we actually, you know, aware of all of these invisible folks. And then the whole chatter on domestic health, whether you should pay them, not pay them, get them in your homes, not get them in your homes. I think that was just the last straw, right? And I shared with you that, you know, for a lot of households, what you spend on domestic health is anywhere between one to 3% of your income, right? And to debate and discuss whether you should pay them, not pay them, was just something that, you know, made me realize that on one hand, as a country, we are capable of deep compassion, but we are continuously othering, you know, the poor. We're continuously doing that in our individual actions. And we need to first look at ourselves before we want to go around and, you know, change things for others. Thanks, Reshma. That, that's really beautiful. And, you know, a couple of things that you said uh, really caught my eye, especially from a professional standpoint. And I want to come back to that. Um, you spoke about trusting partners. Um, it, it almost came across as you didn't trust them in previously, or you had to do a lot more uh, to entrust them responsibility. But because the situation is such, you're just going to have to trust them and believe that they'll do the right thing. And you spoke about changing the way you do business by saying, if you need something, tell me, I'm not going to put you through a six month long process before I approve it, I'm going to actually sanction it immediately because I need that, you know, I know that's the need of the hour. So I'm going to come back to you and just uh, ask you a little bit about uh, what got you to doing that. And in defining the new normal, um, will that now be the new normal? Will you start trusting your partners um, rather than, you know, doubting them? I'm not sure that that's necessarily the right uh, way to look at it. But if you can just think about that and I'll come back to you um, and ask you a little bit more about that. Uh, Radhika, same question to uh, kick us off. What have the last 100 days looked like? Um, you're involved with a whole host of different, uh, not only philanthropies, but also running schools. Um, you know, and education has been top of mind for every parent, whether it's board exams or it's making sure uh, children are safe and still learning. Um, you know, school is going to start tomorrow. 
Um, what is that going to look like? Uh, everyone sadly has an opinion on uh, how education should be redefined, right? And yes. uh, sadly, they don't have the same opinion. So that makes life very tough for you. Um, yes. And I'd love to get your thoughts again, both if you can give me on a personal side, what have the last 100 days looked like? And more importantly, on the professional side, how have you dealt with um, you know, the challenges that have come your way given the multiple uh, you know, uh, responsibilities that you start? Um, Amit, I've like um, both Reshma and Anu Aunty, um, anxiety and anger and uh, fear were my partners for the first few days. Um, and, you know, a very dear friend of mine, um, she knows me very well. And she said, you know, you can't do the work that you do if you don't wear your own oxygen mask. So start wearing your oxygen mask so that you can support the work that you do. Um, and I realized that I'm a kind of a person who has to keep doing things, you know, it's just inherently me and that's what drives me that is my oxygen and um thankfully we just literally i think 13th the pandemic was announced 27th uh, at blind relief association we said we have to do something we have to do something even if we can't support the visually impaired who are all gone back to their homes let's open our kitchen and let's let's start cooking okay and we have to be part of this pandemic in a meaningful way and uh, so I'll take you through blind relief first. It was opening up the kitchen, uh, doing a fundraiser to support migrant laborers. Then we get start getting these frantic calls from visually impaired students who live in DU or in bus fees saying we don't have ration because we can't stand in queues. I mean, do something. Then we started supporting the PWDs because you know people with disability really get neglected. And we said, we're gonna change our mandate and we're going to be there for people with disability. It really doesn't matter whether they're visually impaired or deaf, you know, it really doesn't matter. And really the blind school started doing all these things. We opened our stitching unit and we started making masks. Um, we run a, a, a government aided school. And you know that there's sometimes resistance in, um, to change. But I have to say this time the teacher were, teachers were so open to reaching out to our children um, they were ready to learn. I don't know what has happened, but they have embraced technology. They wanted to reach out to our children, communicate with them. They've started recording lessons. We are putting that up on, uh, you know, on Teams. And it's, it's heartening to see that change. So I'm going to talk about more the positive part of it. Um, and, uh, you know, they even attended the Ashoka K-12 seminars. I mean, I, if I had tried that literally three months ago, I know I wouldn't have made any breakthrough there. Uh, we also realized, you know, this is the right time for us to introduce new courses at Blind Relief to empower our visually impaired. So we started doing these computer training courses online, which is Pan India. And now we're introducing the entrepreneurship course for them. And we're very excited. And I have to say the creativity that's flowing in the organization is heartening because we are trying to, it's, it's an opportunity. We see this challenge as an opportunity to create uh, more skills for our visually impaired. Uh, so I'll leave blind relief there. And it was extreme. I'm, I'm very happy with the way the team has supported um, everybody. Uh, they've taken a pay cut on their own. Um, you know, it's an NGO and they all said that we're going to take a pay cut because we need to make sure that our institution survives. Um, moving to Sriram school, it's a privileged school, but children are same everywhere. It has been very, very difficult uh, because unfortunately we haven't had a clear direction from the education um, sector. So Shiram School decided that uh, we are going to do what works for our children, whether it means that we have to do things that are not going to be very accepted. We were not going to open the school. We had decided that long time ago, whether even the government mandates to open the school in July, Shiram School is not going to open till we see it. We are ready to get our kids into our portal. Uh, Shiram School always, you be, in Delhi, you know, there's pollution lakes and everything. So we were very equipped to deal with the online learning, but we didn't realize that this was going to go on for so long. So the teachers have had to rework the curriculum. Um, there is a lot of anxiety in our children now, which is emerging. And as of yesterday, we have taken a call that in Shiram School, the first half an hour of our school online is going to be circle time. 
it is imperative that we work on the mental health of our children as much as our teachers. So now even in Shiram school, we're going to provide counseling sessions for our teachers. We realize that this pandemic is causing so much anxiety. Now it's at home, right? It's, it's in everybody's home. And even our teachers are going through this anxiety. And if we don't support them, they wouldn't be able to support our students. Um, but I have to give credit to our teachers, how they've risen to the occasion, uh, managing home, managing their husbands, their children, uh, cooking food, but yet being there in front of the screen for the six hours to hold our children. It has been, you're a parent. I, I have to give them credit that none of them have said that we can't do this. Uh, extensive training on um, how to enable technology, the sphere of technology, even in a teacher in Shiram school. Uh, so we've had to support them. And um, yes, it's been uh, challenging. Our kids have really done a phenomenal job of embracing the change. Uh, but we need to hold them now because considering now this will go on for another six months, I don't see schools opening. Uh, major chaos and anxiety with the whole uh, exam. Uh, what a mess. I mean, I mean, what are we doing? I, I, I don't understand why can't we take a decision and support our children. Um, there is no clear guidelines as to what is going to happen next with the board exam. And uh, we need some, somebody to take some decision, you know. Um, unfortunately, we, are, we have to follow the board. Uh, I have to give credit to IB board, which immediately decided to cancel IB exams. They immediately sort of, you know, uh, came up with a plan uh, B and uh, supported our children. I think, uh, I think um, we, as schools, we need guidance. We need to know that the boards are going to support our children. Um, coming to a cancer um, NGO that I work with, uh, we've had to reconfigure ourselves. We're converting our van into a COVID testing van now. We're supporting cancer patients uh, because they're getting frantic calls saying, uh, we're not getting beds. Nobody wants to cheat us. So trying to connect them to AIMS or any kind of funding they can, we can give them. So, uh, CAPIT has gone through, we've changed what we used to do. We used to do cervical cancer screening. We're not doing that. And I don't see us doing that for probably a year. Uh, craft sector has taken a big hit. Um, you know, everybody talks about agriculture and this makes me really, really unhappy that there is no focus on the craft sector. And uh, that is your second employer in the country. Um, and uh, it's the first time, Amitav, in many, many years, I've been involved in the craft sector for almost 14 years now, that there is one voice that's coming out of the craft sector. Everybody is talking the same language. Everybody wants to support them. There is so much collaboration happening between different NGOs to support our craftsmen. Uh, at Craft Council, we have tried to uh, provide opportunities for sale. They're stuck with raw materials. We've been trying to get them ration, just sustainability, you know, before they do anything. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm very, very worried about what will happen to our craft sector, what will happen to this creative industry. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's my experience for the last three months. I have Thank to you. say that I've worked very hard in the last few uh, months. I mean, it has been an exciting journey work-wise for me, very creative and very exciting. No, thanks, Radhika. Thanks for sharing all of those different perspectives and I appreciate uh, all the different hats you wear. And uh, I think the follow-up question I want to ask you, if you can dwell on that a little bit, is really about how are you going to make your priorities, given that uh, you straddle all these different, uh, you know, responsibilities. Uh, one has been hit more than the other. Uh, maybe that is a short-term um, phase maybe that will change in the medium to long term how will you as a philanthropist and somebody who is spearheading some of these organizations how do you start prioritizing and see where do you need to put your efforts whether it's your money or your time or or uh, or even awareness how do you do that um, and maybe that looks very different from uh, the past so i'll come back to you and ask you that question anu i'd like to come back to you like i had said uh, you know, specifically about what you have been involved in over the last hundred days. Uh, you have started talking about a little bit about the changes you've made at Akanksha and TFI, um, which are which are organizations you've supported for many, many years. But you also said you felt the need to support migrant workers who 
wanted to get home. This is, uh, I'm assuming this is not something that was a problem in the past, but it's a problem you identified today. Um, and in addition to supporting Akanksha and TFI, you as an individual and then as a philanthropist took that on as well. Um, if you can just share what got you to thinking about that. And, and, and the reason I want to say that is there are a lot of philanthropists today that uh, leave alone taking on additional initiatives are even reneging from their commitments of existing initiatives. Uh, you've gone completely the other way. Uh, you said I'm supporting Akanksha more, uh, but I'm also doing, uh, you know, migrant labor uh, support work. So if you can just share a little bit more about sure. that, I think the uh, yeah. viewers would love to hear more. Uh, you know, Mayor, my daughter and I were in a dilemma that should we, we as a family from our philanthropy support Teach for India and from our CSR, we support Akansha. And uh, we were wondering whether we should cut down a little bit because education can wait but hunger cannot wait so should we divert some of the teach for india uh, money to uh, migrant workers for their survival and then we said that what use is survival if after that we have nothing to offer no teaching no employability so we said no we will not cut down a penny and we will dip into our philanthropic pool and give from there to the migrant workers. So we didn't at all cut down in any way, but added more to philanthropy pool. That's what we did. And for Akanksha, the same dilemma, should we divert it? And we said, no, we'll dip into the reserves. And uh, we also discussed that this year is bad, but the next two years could be worse. And what will we do if we have no profit? But we said we'll dip further into the reserves. And our board is very supportive also. But I have a little doubt if we can increase the 2% to more, the CSR compulsory CSR, because it's our shareholders' money also. And when we don't give them any dividend, do we have a right to increase this? But we'll take each day as it comes. Right now, our decision is to support fully and dip into the reserves. Yeah. I know. I think that's uh, you know a really uh, interesting uh, insight. Uh, not only have you said, "What do I need to do this year?" but uh, knowing very well that the next couple of years could look worse. Uh, and what do you do then? And again, you said something which I think will spark the interest of others: is to say we'll dip even further. Um, uh, I, I think that is, uh, you know, that's the humanitarian approach that we need to take. We need to know that this is not a pandemic that is going to disappear anytime soon, uh, but also be prepared for the longer term at the same time. Uh, I think you've done wonderfully well to say, here's my immediate reaction. Here's what is the need of the hour. But I understand that this may go on a little bit longer. Um, I'm glad you raised the question about saying, how do I deal with shareholder expectations? Is this a question we should be asking our shareholders? Uh, you know, that maybe I need to dip into uh, the dividend that I would have given you because it needs to be given to another cause. So thank you for, for uh, you know, raising that even as a question right now. Uh, Reshma, if I can just, you know, uh, ask you, uh, you know, like I said, you spoke about trusting partners. Uh, that for me is a new normal. Uh, being a, a recipient of money from foundations like yours and others um, and philanthropists like over the last three months to convince um, organizations to continue their giving, but also uh, ask them if I could repurpose some of that money. You know, today for me to educate the child uh, the way I did in the past, is a lesser concern than putting food on the table because that's what the parents want. And all of you have said that, right? I have gone back to our funders and asked for that permission and very gladly so, most of them have agreed. Um, so that trust element, all of a sudden, the equation changed. Uh, I'd love to understand from you what, apart from the crisis, how did you actually internally in a large organization 
like Hindustan Unilever. How do you arrive at something like that? And what does that make you start thinking as a human being about what the future uh, might entail? So I'm going to first uh, you know, address your question on trust, Amita. I think trust exists. Uh, we take the crutch of process as a way of just backing up our judgment and our instinct. And of course, we have to acknowledge that we live in a deeply regulatory environment where every question can be challenged. And so there's a little bit of, you know, let's buy peace and make sure that we've got our ground covered. So I think that's one. Uh, the second aspect is also that, uh, you know, by the nature of relationship between funders and grantees, unfortunately, is has been made of one of power. If you actually have an honest conversation with funders, we want to do as much as actually our, our organizations want to. Right? But there is this whole, you know, you are funder and I am the implementer, not realizing that many of us actually did work in the trenches before we took on the role. What side of the table we sit on is a matter of time. I've been actually on both sides of the table. I've been on the receiving side and now I'm on this side as well. Uh, so I think as we've talked to funders across the board, right, what we've realized is that the, that, you know, the immediacy of response is something that no one has shied away from, notwithstanding, as Anu mentioned, that we all see that the next two to three years are really going to be the long haul, right? So I think to that extent, people have done what they could do as part of their immediate response. Um, and I think that the, the, the element of trust uh, will get strengthened. So it's not like there was no trust before, but I think that, uh, you know, we've just also understood that there are, there are uh, faster ways of coming to decisions without, you know, making people go through hoops. Um, I also feel that there's going to be a lot of collaboration amongst funders uh, because we've now realized, Amitabh, that the unit of one grant, one grantee, one program may have just gone way past its shelf life, right? What we're interested in is really like shaping, you know, lives for the better, whether we want to do it in education, whether we want to do it in entrepreneurship, and I think that if it would be disappointing if after all of what we've witnessed and experienced personally and in our organizations, we go back to, you know, literally business as usual and start looking at a project as the unit of change. I think it's going to be individuals who will drive change. It's going to be institutions that will drive change. And we will have to then understand what are the calls that we are taking. And if you are taking a call, you know, on an individual, you've got to let them thrive. You can't give them a prescription. And if you're going to do the same for an organization, you've got to let them grow instead of, you know, giving markers for every development, you know, uh, um, milestone and to kind of test whether you're good enough or not. So um, how this will pan out, I don't know. But what I do realize in all the conversations, and in fact, I have to say that funders have also, you know, communicated. I haven't spoken to, you know, uh, organizations that co-fund with us as much as I have in the last three, three months. And I see that there is this sense of it. So I want to clarify, it's not, there was never a trust deficit. Uh, if anything, uh, it's only gotten, you know, strengthened further. I think there is a clearer acknowledgement that we're on the same side. We're invested in the same issues, right? Uh, and we want to be part of the solution, right? So I think, yes, and, but there are all kinds of organizations, but at least I can speak from, you know, the, from our work as well as from, uh, you know, the work that we do across uh, partners. It helps to be an independent foundation also, Amita, to your question, how do you manage this and navigate this in a large organization? Uh, it, it does help. We've again got a very supportive board uh, and uh, uh, we have the flexibility and the mandate to make sure that we take uh, you know, the decisions which are in the best interests of our communities. So uh, that helps, that helps a lot. You know, Reshma, like I said, I have been hearing this from some of the people I work with, some of the funders that fund us as well. And it's very heartening to see this because there's a human aspect to it. And I think people are applying that heart uh, to decision making. Um, you know, I just want to put it out there for all the listeners, as well as you being part of large giving is, you know, uh, as, as a human race, we're sometimes very quick to forget. Uh, we, we'd like to call that resilience. Um, but I think this is a time when we should really reflect and say, what are those 
real changes we do want to make which should you know continue to exist and not resort back to what we had as the old normal um so i i really appreciate you saying that these changes have come about for what what they are but they've also got you thinking um you know for the future and 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 uh, really appreciate your candid uh, I mean, the only thing is that we should not set ourselves up in this process, right? No, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I think the, you know, and to uh, again to Anu's point, it's each day as it as it comes. It's very difficult for us to predict that what will we be doing three months from today. Absolutely. I think the intention matters far more right now than what could be the possible solution. Absolutely. I and what the last three months have shown is that intent, the intent to do. what is fair yes. not good what is fair yes. exists and it exists across the board yes and now how do you you know carry that whole you know good uh, energy which exists right and make sure that it it finds its 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 blending place i think that has become that is what we carry as accountability i think that is what we we must make sure we do well absolutely i think you worded it beautifully so thank you for that ishma Uh, radhika let me come back to you you know you you shared about the blind school uh, you shared about how teachers have really risen to the occasion um something that was a challenge before i know that you know because they didn't feel maybe as concerned or passionate um about what they were doing all of a sudden today you're saying everyone is rising not only at the blind school but even at the shri ram school uh, and i've witnessed that being a parent myself of what teachers are doing and it's not 6 hours of work for them it's 16 hours of work for them because we don't know what's happening behind the scenes uh, you spoke about the crafts uh, uh, sector being the la second largest employer in the country but dying because maybe it's no longer a priority for people to go out and recognize their work and purchase their work and uh, you know make sure they continue to earn a fair wage uh, you know you are going to have to repurpose your time your commitment your money uh, basis what you've seen happen in the last 100 days and to reshma's point you know today we are forced to make decisions that are only one week out or maybe mm. in the best case a couple of months out how do you go about doing that radhika and what has been going on in your mind when it comes to these various different things you're grappling with how do you make those decisions i know i get this i get asked this question many times you do so many things but you know amita i just love what i do i really if you ask me to choose uh, which organization i would choose i i can't make that choice um i think for me it's um i love i it just gives me the oxygen that i am able to impact life and i won't choose anything i won't choose anything differently right but at the moment if you ask me i think blind relief needs my time a lot more right now uh because uh we need to make sure it sustains itself uh csr funding isn't coming in uh visually impaired are not going to be given the importance uh and you know we have this big uh, fundraiser called the uh, blind school diwali mela which actually is the bread earner for uh, blind relief i don't think we can do that in uh, november and i we are really stuck at the moment and uh, i can't let this organization which has been there for 75 years to collapse uh thinking out of the box uh is what we are doing uh we are already starting a fundraiser and making a noise about that you know organization institutions like these ngos need sustainability um and i'm uh, working to, with the team to come up with solutions in house so that we can raise money uh shiran school i think we need to start working on for me personally what i see is redefining education in shiran school as well uh what is the role of the teacher going to be um i think the teachers are not going to be content hubs anymore they are going to be mentors and they are going to be uh, counselors uh because the world that we are going to inherit it inherit post covid covid or the normal world that we we will have uh our kids are going to come out with a lot of anxiety they will need the reassurance uh i can already see it in the grade 12 which is the current grade 12 they have no idea what's going to happen they have no clue what it's going what their life is going to look like i think uh as educators that's what we need to focus on 
Uh, and I would, I think um, our role as promoters is going to be to work on teacher training, just teacher training, just holding them to make sure that they hold our children. Uh, thankfully at the craft sector, we have an amazing team. It doesn't require so much of my time, but I think Blind Relief Association and the Shiram schools will need a lot of my time going forward. Um, and uh, I'm a kind of a person who likes to keep doing things and I'm looking forward to starting something of my own as well, which has been very exciting last three months working on it. I'm super excited about it. And really, I think the last three months have really made it very clear for me what I see myself doing, what my purpose in life is. And um, I'm very excited about the journey ahead. Um, I'm not scared anymore. I'm positive. Um, I'm hopeful that education in rural India will change. Everybody is talking education now. We never had that scenario. Nobody was talking about education. You know, there was a digital divide in, you know, post pre-COVID too, but now everybody is talking about it. And just imagine the possibility of what we can do in India as far as education is concerned. Uh, the, the ability to reach, uh, you know, good quality education to somebody who's sitting back or beyond of Uttarakhand or Bihar, uh, the same opportunity that a Sriram school kid gets, you know, just the content wise. I, I'm very hopeful and I'm very excited it's just that I hope, like everybody has said, I hope we don't lose this momentum. We don't lose this momentum. We use this, um, you know, as I call it, the social crisis, humanitarian crisis to better our world. And uh, I'm hopeful. Yeah, Radhika, that, I think that's very helpful. And being someone who's working in education, I, I, I completely echo what you're saying. I also want to put it here that, you know, I look at this almost as two different phases of our work. The, the, the current phase that we're currently doing is very reactionary and instinctive in nature. We're all responding immediately and saying, let's do this, let's do that. This seems to be the right thing. That seems to be the right thing because we don't know better. And most of us have never faced this before. In fact, no one has. And then I think of this, the, you know, the, the second phase, which is more the informed phase. You know, we learn what went wrong. We learn what didn't work. Uh, we'll know from the, the, what we've done in the past, whether it was impactful or not, uh, and maybe alter how we actually deliver our solutions. So I think all of us yeah. need to be very cognizant of that, that we may be doing the wrong things right now, but as long as we are learning from them and, and yeah. adjusting fast enough, that really should be where we end up a few months from now. Yeah, I mean, just to just to add to that, initially when the lockdown happened and everything was like, oh, great technology, education, but, you know, slowly we're realizing, no, social contact is equally important. You know, kids need to go to school or universities. They need that interaction. Absolutely. So blended learning is what we need to focus on. You know, you, you, you can't replace the teacher. You just yeah. cannot. It, it's out there in front of all of us. Yeah. But the opportunity to provide to a child who's sitting in a government school, I yeah. mean, I just, I'm amazed at the opportunity that we can, we need to work towards this. And I yeah. hope we never lose momentum and sight of this. And, and, you know, I think Radhika, just to make another point, we have to remember India is not Delhi and Mumbai. And not at all. We work in Madhya Pradesh where there are 98 lakh children that go to 120,000 government schools. Less than 2 lakh, that's 2% of children have access to a mobile phone that they could use for an hour every day. Just yeah. 2 lakh out of 90 lakh, 98 lakh children. So we've got to remember that when we think of a digital solution, in the case of Madhya Pradesh, we're leaving out 96 lakh children that don't have a mobile device in their house. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah. you know, this is my point that we are responding, thinking that's the solution, but three months from now we'll realize it's probably not the right one. But as yeah. long as we can alter and adjust quickly enough, we're on to the right thing. Uh, we've got about 10, 12 minutes left. And uh, Anu, I'm going to come back to you with the last question and I'll see if there are any other questions from the, the audience. Uh, but, the, you know, rather than asking you what the future looks like, because, you know, I think we've been on multiple webinars and people have given their perspectives. I don't want to focus on that as much as I want to focus on what does healing look like? How do you start in small, simple steps, the healing process while we are still facing the crisis. And uh, Anu, you and I had spoken a few days ago and you shared some wonderful, very practical things that you even do at home 
Uh, and if you can, each of you share what does healing look like? I think all of us can take that back and start practicing it on a day to day basis. Sure. Uh, Amita, the first thing is starting with yourself. Stay calm and spread that calmness. That's the first thing I would say. Then, listening to all of us, the audience must have realized that the NGOs are starving for funds. So if you can, please find an NGO which you believe in, you trust, and donate, and really dip into your pockets and donate generously. Uh, recently, just two days ago, I came across that the government is amending the Environment Impact Assessment, EIA, to let the ease of business be easy. But we have forgotten the gains of COVID where our, our air is so much cleaner and we are going to go 10 steps backward. So please oppose it. Sit at home and oppose this EIA amendment. I would say while you are sitting at home, reflect. Uh, if we are being fair, just to our domestic workers, for example, we miss them. We can't do without them. But do we pay a fair wage? Do we have medical insurance for them? Recently, one of my maid's mother got sick. And in a week, the bill came to almost two lakhs. So how are they going to ever pay? So would we be able to live just for a day in their condition, in their slums? So if we think about that, and then going further, can we think about the migrant laborers, laborers and what kind of laws are there in our country? Each of us can, you don't have to study everything, but when, if you are interested, let us know, and we have to build a momentum to put pressure on the government to change things. For example, when you move from your city, you lose your voting rights. So migrant workers have no voting rights, so no politician is interested in them. Uh, that's one thing. Up to now, the ration card was not valid in another state. Fortunately, that has been done. But there are so many things which need to change for 8 to 10% of our population. So can we become a little more sensitive and not just think of our enjoyment, our parties, our having a good time. Thank you. Anu, thank you so much for that. I think those are very, very practical uh, suggestions, uh, things that all of us could get involved with, whether it's signing of petitions or it's, you know, taking up a a cause or signing up with an NGO. So I really appreciate you sharing that and very practical, easy to do, um, just a matter of awakening your conscience to, to make it happen. So thank you for that. Reshma, your thoughts on how does the healing journey begin? Where does it begin? I think it starts with us. Um, and it is about understanding that uh, if you want to do something, first and foremost, we have to work on ourselves. And it's going to require immense patience and empathy. Uh, um, you know, Radhika alluded to how you know kids are struggling. I think we're finding people in our families and our teams and our organizations struggling. And uh, you know, if you're in leadership positions, uh, you know, you have to understand that the way you conduct yourself in this time is really going to you know go a long haul. Which incidentally also means the way you conduct yourselves at home, right? If you're scrapping with your mom. You know, understand where that's coming from. Uh, you know, everyone's got their own anxiety and it rests in different places. And I really think that this is the hardest thing to do. I have to say the professional staff, it's challenging, but this is going to be the hardest thing that we would have to do because of the sheer duration uh, that this is going to test us for. I think we've got to learn to listen more um, and listen without judgment uh, because people actually are feeling isolated. And whether it's communities, migrants, farmers, artisans, I think there is huge value in them knowing that someone is out there listening. You know, so I think that is extremely important that we, that we do. Uh, 
I talked about the fact that, you know, we need to be conscious of who's missing in our own circle. You know, uh, Anu talked about domestic staff and I think that I wish we were more formalized as a sector where benefits and fair wages were more mandated because I think that the kind of conduct we've seen where people have just let go of staff without any 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 compensation, I think it's just, I don't, how does it sit on anybody's conscience, frankly? But I think that it is also about, you know, as I said, your florist needs your business. Uh, you know, the vendors who you've interacted with need your business. Uh, and how are you also keeping your eye out on who's really kind of missing from your own universe that you know so intimately, right? Um, I think what you have, what we are not using enough still is our voice. So use your voice. It's extremely powerful. Right? Whether that's the voice you're using in your living rooms or in your organizations, I think that if you have a point of view in terms of what you can do better as a family, as a community, as a school, you know, I think it's really important to get, to channelize that that voice as well. Um, I'm, I think we also have to kind of switch mode between charity and agency, uh, and I think I've. I always struggled with the language around it, but I recently read uh, Jacqueline Novogratz's book, uh, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. And she talks, the first line of the manifesto is what struck with me, that stand with the poor, not for, not by, but stand with the poor, right? And it which really means that, you, that we work, you know, with, you know, our students, with people with disabilities, with craftsmen, we basically work to develop their own capacity to be able to handle the kind of, you know, opportunities and crisis that's going to come our way. And so how do we switch? You know, charity makes us feel entitled, but, you know, standing with someone is when you have no expectation of gratitude whatsoever, right? And I think that that is going to be a very interesting shift. I want to, I'd be very curious whether, you know, in Indian philanthropy or even in individual philanthropy, we will be able to make just that substantive shift in the way we think about, about giving. Uh, but, you know, just because you've helped everyone who's knocked on your doorstep does not mean they owe you anything. You've made sure that they survive to see another week or another month. But now what can you do, you know, so that they get their feet back on the ground? So there's a lot that, that we can do, but we've got to start with ourselves. I think that's, that's, that's it. And Reshma, what you just said about, you know, uh, this feeling of gratitude and, and, and charity. Uh, I mean, in Hindi, if I had to say it is, you know, some people actually respond saying, Mujhe aapka daan nahi chahiye. you know, that don't, don't think you're doing me a service. And I just had that experience with a, a domestic help who couldn't come to work because they were a part-time worker. But I told them, listen, I'm going to continue paying your wage. And they said, I don't think that's fair. I'm not working for you. Why should you pay me? I don't need your charity. You know, so everyone has a sense of pride and you never want to break that because, you know, it's, uh, it's the people feel, want to have that feeling of respect uh, and dignity. And I think by giving them something, you break that unknowingly. This is the thing, you know, dignity has become such an important, uh, you know, value that we live by. And I think we have to acknowledge that we are all connected. We've got to stop the othering. If we keep doing that, we have yep. built this distance. We yep. are not going to have trust. Yep. We're not going to have impact, right? Absolutely. So, you know, whether it's your staff, whether it's vendors, whether it's communities we work with, uh, you know, and we've done this as part of our readings, right? The whole spirit of Ubuntu. We are one spirit, right? And so can we, you know, make sure that we are actually in our own conduct, we embody that value when we work with people. And, you know, my God, my mind just kind of opened up when I said, I've struggled with articulation. And it was just a simple preposition, right? To stand with them. Yeah, no, I like that. Thank you so much for that. Radhika, if we'll close on you, I know we're running out of time, but if we can ask you, what does, what does healing look like? Uh, how do we begin that journey? I think healing uh, starts from yourself first. Uh, you can't support the people who depend on you if you're not going to heal. Uh, for me personally, I think healing means also to have a passion in life other than work. 
uh, it's important to have a hobby, whether it's reading, whether it's singing, whether it's running. And for me, my, I have had these two hobbies which have actually made my last three months um, bearable, if I may say so. Um, I think it's very important. Healing also starts with the way we treat our elderly um, at home. Um, you know, our parents are going through so much anxiety. I see that uh, with my father-in-law and my parents. And uh, I think it's very important and considering the kind of country we live in, uh, it's important to hold them right now. Healing starts from there. Um, like everybody has said, our staff, I mean, I couldn't have been able to do the work that I'm doing if my kids were not taken care of, my father-in-law was not taken care of, my husband was not taken care of, I would have been gone crazy, right? I am I'm in, in extreme gratitude for the work they do please have the ability and the humility to thank them, you know, because really they are serving us for the last, what, what, 100 days without a break. I mean, for them, their families are in the villages. I don't think we even try to understand what they are going through. It's so much about yourself that you forget. And I think healing starts from there. Healing starts from home, how we treat the people who are with us, uh, our staff, our parents, our children, I mean, I, 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 I'm amazed at the way my children are handling this. I mean, they haven't cribbed. They're full of gratitude for the life that they have. I mean, this is what COVID has done. And so be it. So healing starts from there, just realizing how fortunate you are and you have the ability to give Amitabh. I think our country needs to um, realize that it needs so much of help that everybody can make a difference everybody can make a difference. And it, it doesn't mean you need to do big things in life. It could be as small as educating somebody at home, you know, how you treat your staff at home, you know. Uh, if you even give 100 rupees a month to an organization, choose an organization, support it, give your time. You don't always have to give money. We need people to volunteer. We need lots of people. So I think healing starts by, when you, you, when you look at the bigger picture, and you're just a small dot there. You know, when, when the picture becomes bigger and you become small, that's where the heating starts. Thank you, Radhika. Um, I, I think, you know, we've had wonderful uh, conversations. I really want to thank each of you. Uh, before we close, I thought I'll just share some of the comments uh, that have come out. Uh, the questions I think I've managed to weave into the questions I've asked you. So I'm not going to ask any follow-up questions because we are out of time. But I do want to, you know, just give you what people have said on the chat. Um, one gentleman said that if we can just stretch the thinking on the digital divide, um, which Radhika brought up, you know, to think of that very specifically, um, that what we might end up doing is widen the gap, uh, you know, of those who are connected versus those who are not. Um, and I think that was a good point you brought up. Uh, somebody said, thanks for bringing out good perspectives and positive messages. Amazing things are happening and these ladies are examples of what can be done. So thank you to all three of you. Um, uh, a, a lady said that, uh, you know, the way I had spoken about the situation I had when I wanted my domestic person to be paid a wage and he didn't want to come. She's saying, you know, don't give it as charity, but believe in their life as much as you believe in your life. So Rishma, to your point, standing with them, right? Not for them. Um, yeah, and I think all around there's a, a person who I know I'm going to suggest she just reach out to you. She works uh, in an organization that is associated with women in real estate. And I know she wanted to know if uh, she can involve you in that. Uh, I'm going to recommend that she just write to you directly rather than uh, pose the question to you here. Um, those are all the questions that have come. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, comments and praise for all three of you. Uh, and the wonderful session. So let me close by thanking uh, Anu, Radhika, Reshma for spending their morning uh, with all of you. I'm hoping all the viewers and listeners enjoyed this. I'd like, like to thank the Ananta Aspen Center, uh, A, for uh, recognizing the role of women and carrying on with this series. Uh, I think we need to do it more often. So I will urge the center to look at that. But I applaud them uh, for every time bringing in fabulous women who have so much to share and are doing so much. So with that, I'd like to close and, and thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.